let me introduce our panel chair, um, uh, um, Professor Jason Wallace, here here at Sanford. He he he's the Stockham Chair of Western Intellectual History. So, um, Dr. Wallace, could you come up? Okay, thank you, Dr. McDermott. I I am in the history department here and uh, the undergraduate school and. Every now and then they call us to pinch it or bunt or <laughs> foul out, but uh, I'm I'm really <laughs> I'm really happy to be a, a part of this. Um, thank you for asking asking me. We we heard uh, four very impressive and uh, provocative presentations on three complex uh, theological ideas or potentially theological ideas: uh, race the nation, and covenant. Uh, each one of those contains enough uh, substance uh, within them as, as categories to, to isolate for a conference, much less collapsing them all together, which is exactly the art and maybe science we're trying to achieve here. I thought what I'd do for the sake of time, because this is, uh, this is your conference. Uh, I just work here. Uh, I want you to have the opportunity to discuss and engage the panelists. But I thought what I'd do is just sort of paint as best I can an overview uh, with maybe a, a rhetorical um, uh, statement or rhetorical question thrown in at the end uh, of my summary uh, to help get the, help get the um, conversation going. Uh, so I'll just I'll dive in with um, all four questions at once and then we'll see which one you want to pick and go with and that for the sake of time we'll open it up for you and hopefully we can wrap up at the latest by 10 45 uh, is is the goal so we want to monitor that as well for rabbi berman um, in the hebrew bible and particularly the the book of ruth or boaz as he as he illuminated for us we see the idea of covenant expanding to the outsider and I think my question and again we'll hold it to see if you want to visit it or not or if we want to go to the floor how do we also see judgment and blessing uh, expanding or retracting in light of the covenant how, how else can we interpret the Hebrew Bible or help us see the Hebrew Bible as the covenant always contains promises blessing but also curse and punishment along with it that 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 came to mind as I as I listen and I, I'm sure you can answer that in 45 seconds to a minute but um, but <laughs> and then uh, for Rabbi Dr. Mitch Rockland um, that the problem of memory the problem of memory and how we translate memory through generations it it haunts all of us, um, regardless of our race. We, we do it. How do defeat and memory shape our identities? And how is exile a way of refining memory and how we talk to our children and pass on uh, the kind of questions and answers? Maybe not answers. Maybe just frame the questions correctly for the first time, <laughs> if we're lucky. Uh, how, how does that? How, how have you reflected on that uh, through both your studies and and then your your experience for Dr. Mc, McDermott and and the exposition of the National Covenant uh, through the Puritans and then Jonathan Edwards? Uh, race is uh, the great scar. It's the slavery and it's and it's long long echo are, are the great scar the great transgression that we live with socially uh, daily um, but what other sins fit under this paradigm of the national covenant um, even though it, I don't want us to go for too far afield from the boundaries of the conference the what was provocative about the talk to me is if we are under a national covenant, what other sins fall under 
uh, these problems? And does it help us, if we think about that, does that help us think about the problem of race and reconciliation in new or uh, creative ways? And then finally, uh, Dr. Mitchell and his talk about weaponizing identity in the name of justice. He referenced um, de Tocqueville several times in his speech. And what came to mind uh, as I listened was Tocqueville's um, admonition in Democracy in America on the, the importance of private associations, um, an, a, a kind of uh, echo of uh, Edmund Burke's little platoons in some ways in the, for the frontier, I suppose. Um, but what, what does this mean? What do these private associations mean to a successful free society, and how do we prevent them from tribalizing or weaponizing? So those were, my, those were my thoughts as I listened. I am happy now to open it up. Uh, if you would like, if anybody would like to raise their hand and try one of those or ignore me completely, because I'm a moderator. <laughs> so I'm happy also to turn to the floor, but I, I open the floor or the panel now for discussion, or I will pick one of you, so. <laughs> well, well, why don't we answer the question? Sure, uh, sure. One at a time. That's fine. So blessing and curse, what's remarkable about the Hebrew Bible is how, how weighted this question is on the collective rather than the individual. There are individual stories in the Hebrew Bible of, of good deeds that are measured by, that are given reward and bad deeds that are punished, but mostly, 99%, I would say, of what the Hebrew Bible is encouraging us to do is to think of ourselves as collectives. And it's only really only when you ask that question that I realize how unintuitive it is for us to think about ourselves in that way. Because we think about right. our own little lives, what's happening with me, with my family, maybe with my neighbors. Once we go beyond that, it really begins to get quite abstract. And yet this is what the Bible is, is insisting upon, to think about ourselves in these much larger abstract <laughs> collectives that not only are we part of, but really shape who we are in ways that we don't often acknowledge. And that therefore the, the, the responsibility is, is to think about what, what is happening to our country. It, or as my wife likes to say when I get into a little spat with my, my, uh, my teenager, and I'm like, well, he was terrible. How, how could you do it? And she says to me, someone has to be the adult here. Uh, and, and we all need to be the adults here about our country. Uh, and, and thinking about, about, you know, to realize, really, I think what, what Professor Mitchell just, you know, really nailed it, that, that there's this larger responsibility that we all have for this country. Uh, and therefore, that means thinking not just about tribal interests, but where is everything going? We're all contributing to that. And we're all going to go down with the ship if we don't, if we don't change things. And that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, and then, um, so, as far as the, uh, the question of uh, memory is concerned, so, you know, it's very interesting because I, I also very much related to what Dr. Mitchell was saying about I I identity politics. There, there, there is a, there is a way, I think, in which um, reconciliation becomes more difficult in the modern era because the, say, the world of the Bible, let's say, you're dealing with nations. So nations can commit wrongs against each other, but nations can also reconcile. And the way that individuals understood each other in the ancient world is they were part of larger groups. This is true, you know, even of the most, um, even of very simple ancient, extremely ancient religions, even, even um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the notion of a, a totem pole, right? If you would ask uh, an aboriginal uh, in, in Australia, who are they? What's their, you wouldn't, the word identity, right? How do we, we consider, you know, not really identity, but kind. They, they would identify with the, uh, the, the totem symbol that, that is of their clan. So they would say, I am, you know, I am the, the, the alligator or, or the, the, the crocodile or, or whatever symbol it might be. And, and the Bible is working on that basis. Um, it, the Jews are, are different, and, and we could talk about how. Um, but fundamentally, um, yeah, the Egyptians enslaved us and they, they killed our children, but we can still let Egyptians into our people at, after a certain point. Nations can come to reconciliation. The, the modern problem is we, we pass down memories, and we don't just pass down memories of national crimes and national sins, um, but we, we have this, this ontological suffering that I, I mentioned at the end. There's this understanding that there are existential evils that cannot be forgiven. 
And, and the question then becomes, well, what do you do if you can't forgive something? Because uh, you, you appreciate evil so much more. And, and, and there, there are different answers to that question. I, I think from, from a, a Jewish perspective, the answer really develops with the, the notion of, of the individual personality. And what Professor Mitchell was saying, you have to deal with people as they are. You have to deal with the individuals. To, to not do so leaves you really up a creek without a paddle, because what it leaves you with is an appreciation of existential evil, which you pass down to your children as memory, and yet you're also unwilling to deal with individuals qua individuals. So when you e eliminate classical liberalism, what you're left with is this odd <coughs> hybrid monster of national crimes raised to the existential level of individual suffering of a personality and with no way to remi to, for, for a remedy. Um, because how can you forgive existential evil? And now the entire nation transcending time, in an old sense, is now stamped with the existential evil that we would normally apply to an individual, not to a nation. Mm. Um, so whatever solution we, we pursue, whether it's dealing with the individual as the individual, like in you know, my experience with you know, coming to terms with you know, a new Germany and, and, and new Germans who are not the same people as, as, as the old Germans, they are different personalities, or whether it's a Christian approach, you know, as far as far as atonement, to save our country from this incredibly corrosive effect, we have mm. to come up with a solution. And 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 when we teach our children, I, I think to just we, we have to we have to come up with a solution for this problem of when we transfer memories. That sets up Dr. Mitchell nicely, I think. So first, yeah. I would say that's yeah. about the finest account of uh, of ident the. the the crisis of identity politics that I've yet heard, the way you just phrased that as this weird hybrid. Um, now, uh, so I've been a Tocqueville scholar since 1989, and, uh, and, and what I'm gonna say here about Tocqueville is, is it's only footnotes on what Bob Woodson's gonna say later on this afternoon. Uh, it, Bob has helped me clarify so cleanly what the problem that uh, America's faced with, and Tocqueville in a way saw this in 1835. So, he has a, early on in the book, in Democracy in America, he says, the local community is always composed of coarser elements, and the enlightened elites will never allow them really to build a world together. And what Tocqueville's saying is, you have to understand that human life is always messed up. <laughs> We're all coarser elements. And the only way we can build a world together is if we have these face-to-face -face relations. So in, in what is, I think, the epithet of the, of the whole book, feelings and ideas are renewed, the heart enlarged, the mind expanded, only by the reciprocal action of men one upon another. It's only in these face-to-face -face relations that we can begin to heal the wounds because our imagination demonizes the other, if you want to use that kind of language. And the only antidote to this is face-to-face -to -face relations. And I think it's not an accident that we have this, this demonic understanding of one another precisely at a time where the state has grown so strong and where individuals don't need each other. They simply need to look up to the state. They don't need to even care about their neighbor. They don't even know who, they, who that neighbor is. Mm -hmm. So we're not gonna get past identity politics mm -hmm. until we recognize that we actually need one another. Then it will be not easy, but we'll stumble forward with each of our encounters. We'll realize that this, this pathological account we had of this other person isn't actually the real account. We have to let people build a world together. One last thing, he's, Tocqueville says, I praise democracy not for what it does, but for what it causes to be done. What it does is a mess. What it causes to be done is it draws people out of themselves and forces them to build a world together, however rickety, and that's what we need. Dr. McDermott? Well, uh, Jason, as I understand your question, you're, you're asking uh, whether it's only whether racism, is, whether racism is the only mortal sin against the National Covenant. Yeah. And the answer is no, of course. There are many other mortal sins. I, I think the primary more mortal sin uh, in both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament is idolatry. Uh, that's, that, that, that's the primary sin that the Hebrew prophets, uh, a, 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 as I understand them, uh, uh, invade against. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, all, all sorts of things can be an idol. Uh, 
and so you know, uh, one one's own family, one one one's own race, of course, and there there's overlap with racism. Um, one one's own nation can be an idol. Um, uh, money, of course, and we talk about that all the time, um, although maybe not enough. <laughs> um, there's also for for Edwards and, and, and the National Covenant, there are also sins against the marriage covenant that are mortal sins that violate the National Covenant. When marriage is despised, you know, marriage between a man and a woman. Um, when a divorce becomes the norm instead of the rare exception. When, um, and then there's the generational covenant, which we'll talk about um, later today. And that's the covenant that God gives to parents to raise their children in the ways of the Lord. And, and, and of course, uh, for the Hebrews, you can't raise your children in the ways of the Lord without learning Torah, teaching your children Torah, and they can't learn Torah unless they know how to read. And, and so it's basic education that uh, Robert Woodson is going to talk about um, later today. You know, so the, these are all yeah. mortal sins against the National Covenant, not only the sin of racism. I'm going to open it up, but I'm, I'm going to take privilege of place just for one minute, and I'm going to ask a very uncomfortable question, I think, in some ways, but it's a question that has to be asked. Why should people of color trust white people in a face-to-face -face relationship? Can I, can I? Yeah, please. So, in a way, that's the point identity politics makes. There's no reason anyone should trust anyone because we get everything by looking up. And I'm saying the only way, I mean, I think there's a theological component of this. I mean, I've been very clear about this, but there's also a face-to-face -face component. I mean, w w we're always gonna be prone to distrust and then you add historical memory and it can ratchet up to levels that are, are agonizing. But, but this, Tocqueville thought that the solution to this was whatever you might think of the other person, if you actually have to count on them, to make something work, your level of trust will increase only through acting. Mm. This is why I get so troubled, I've been in the Middle East off and on for 12, 12 years, all these interreligious dialogues, nothing will come of these. These interracial dialogues, nothing will come of these. The only way <coughs> we can heal wounds is if we actually have to count on each other as human beings to build a world together. This is why localism is so incredibly mm. important. And as the power of the state increases, there's no reason for anybody to trust, and therefore the historical wound only gets exacerbated more and more in our imagination. And we have a political party that plays on it, another political party that ignores it, uh, which is equally preposterous. But the, we're not going to solve this without two things happening. I'm going to sound like Bob here in a second, for a second. We're going to have to be radical pragmatists and recognize that whatever we bring to the table, it's not going to trump the fact that we actually need to work with one another. And we're going to have to put the theological underst the, tr the understanding of transgression and innocence into its proper context because while it is true, slavery produced African Americans as innocents. Yes, this is a historical fact. It is also true that nobody is innocent. That's the problem. It's two things are true at once. Hmm. And if you forget that both things are true at once, then you either go too deep and you forget the historical wound of slavery and say everybody's simply a transgressor, or you go too shallow and you just say it's a racial wound and nobody's responsible personally. It's this both and that we have to hold together. It's incredibly difficult, but one, one way out of this problem, one way to address it, must involve face-to-face -face relations where we build, and I don't even say rebuild, we build together as a nation mm. at the local level. Thank you. Your conference, <laughs> please.
the, so the question is uh, uh, the, the place of Native Americans and the, who takes prominence, prominence of place in the conversation? Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. And, uh, they should. Uh, I, I will say something very, uh, I'm, I'm simply going to state it and you tell me how you deal with it because I haven't figured out after 30 years how to deal with it. So when Tocqueville's the most agonizing section in democracy in America is where he talks about the three races. He talks about the whites, the blacks, and the Indians. <clears throat> and he says, and remember, he's a, Tocqueville's an aristocrat, and he's a fan of arist aristocracy, but know that he knows that that's over. And he sees the American Indians as this, this warrior tribe of aristocrats. And he says, the agony of America is the following. The Indians, because they're so different, because they have this warrior understanding, they're going, to, they're going to separate from the whites. Now, he has highly critical remarks of how the whites have pushed them aside. It, the most burning indictment of how the Americans treated, the white Americans treated the Indians is to be found in those sections. But he says the fate of, of the blacks and the whites, here's what he says, is to mix without combining. And that's the problem, mm. is to mix without combining. So how do we get past the mix without combining? And I see no other way than that we have to count on one another. I don't see any other way of doing that. And that means we have to move back to, the, to some sort of federalism. And look, I, I know the agony of this because it was precisely the federalist argument, right? The local liberties argument, which, which allowed these habits of mastery in various parts of America to perdure for, for a very long time, which required the state to step in. Yes, and it did require the state to step in. But we have to see the agony of this. Human relations can only be healed and fixed through face-to-face. -face. Yet it was precisely the long legacy of face-to-face -face relations that was broken that required the state to step in. Do you see the problem? So, we, so two things are true. We needed the state and perhaps still do need the state in some measure. but to use my language, the state can be a supplement to the institutions of society, but it cannot be a substitute for them. And that's what guilty white liberals have allowed and invited, because that allows them to keep their hands out of this. Uh, Jerry, Jerry uh, uh, Rosen wrote a book called The Hollow Hope in the 1970s, arguing that what happened, the civil rights ended when through legislation a lot of people said, well, the laws are going to take care of it. We no longer have to do this face to face. Mm -hmm. So look, this is an agonizing situation, but the, the, even though the state had to step in, it's also the case that we're not going to heal it except through the institutions of society. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. The state can't do this. Mm -hmm. Well, when I, I find the language of identity politics useful in this sense, <coughs> that when I'm speaking to a group, I let them know that I identify first as a Christian, as a conservative second, and as a Republican third. And for America, I think for it to transcend its racial problems, we have to move towards the American national identity. And so I find value, of course, in our Judeo-Christian roots. Um, I see that as the basis for reconciliation between whites and blacks, because if you actually follow what Christianity teaches, then there's no place for hatred. And I think that that we have to, when it comes to blacks and whites and Hispanics, you have to remind people of actually what the uh, biblical perspective should be. And, and I'm in full agreement with you. My concern is that identity politics takes the idea of transgression and innocence out of its theological context. You know, and that's what, so that's, so I agree with you. This is, this, my whole project here in a way is to suggest that the better way to understand, as I said at the beginning, the longing for justice, the better way to do this is through the theological context that we all want to claim as our own. So, I'm sorry, I was just going to restate for those in the back. We're, I think the, the, the statement is, this is a theological problem. And you, 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 you're affirming that. Um, but let me, let me yeah. add, it's, it's two problems. It is a theological problem, and we, we, we're going to need two things to happen at once. We need to take, take categories of transgression and innocence out of identity politics and put it back in its theological context, but I don't think that's enough, because that could still allow people to sit in the comfort of their own lives and say, well, I've got this resolved theologically. 
I think we also have to have to make the theological, to make the theological insight incarnate. Got it? Mm -hmm. To make the theological insight incarnate, it has to be more than just in our heads. It has to be in our lives. And that's, that's where I think the national part, the, the national thing has to be this living thing, this living embodied thing. And that can't be done just with our ideas. It has to be done in our actions as well. So I think a combination, I'm, I'm stealing from Bob, I gotta say, the combination of, of kind of radical pragmatism in terms of everyday life <laughs> and the theological piece, that's I think the way forward. Just one more question. Uh, the, if the Bible deals with nations and, and, and collective, and then with that constitution uh, and America, American ideals, we think about individualism and the rugged individual, the left thinks in terms of groups, would we be better off as conservatives if we sort of move back to that notion of thinking of ourselves? Like for me, I've always thought of myself as an individual. You know, I'm black, but I'm an individual. I believe these things. But do I need to think of myself differently? Yeah, so the I think the, correct me if, if I misstate it, but the, the question is if, if we're operating out of a hermeneutic if, or if, if the interpretive we're reading the Bible as it, it has a social component. How does that comport with the fact we start by thinking of ourselves as individuals and would conservatives, as you said, or you identify yourself, be better off thinking and starting with the group or the collective or the social? Well, let me just take that quickly. And I don't know if I can have a theological answer to this, but I, but I have what I think is... The, the proper sociological answer. So when Tocqueville says feelings and ideas are renewed, the heart enlarged, the mind expanded only by the reciprocal action of men one upon another, he's saying we don't know who we are. We can't, we, we want to say, no, I'm an individual. We don't know who we are except by talking with other people. We discover who we are through dealing with other people. And I get worried about this kind of individualist communitarian an antipathy that gets set up, either the community or the individual. There's something in the middle which is through face-to-face -face relations, we actually discover who we are. It's not the big community, and it's not the individual. It's, it's the interrelation. It can only happen at the local level. So this, and I think conservatives have missed this. I think we've fixed on the individual much too much, and you're, you're right, you've set up well. On the other side, you've got you know, the, the great communities. What I think the answer here is the something in between these face-to-face -face mediating associations, which aren't quite the individual and aren't quite the state. That's how we can have a palpable understanding that the other isn't this demonic other in my imagination. See, and we've got to literally work together. It's not, it's not a counter groups. It's not, it's not we're going to come together and talk. That won't do it. We literally have to build a world together. That's the only way this works. Rabbis, do you have, would you like to jump in on this one? Sure. So um, I, I think that the, there's consequences to taking a national approach. And sometimes that, that's, that's just the way it is. Nations are nations, right? So uh, George Eliot in Daniel Deronda, the, the novel deals with the uh, problematic of the Jew living in the diaspora, the Jew living in exile. And, and fundamentally, the conclusion is the Jew is fundamentally, the Jewish people are a nation. It's not a religion, it's a nation. And that raises problematics, right? Which, which, have, to be, which have to be addressed. So the question is, um, are we, should we identify as the member of a national group? And, and usually, usually, although not always, the, the Jews were an enigma in, in that sense, right? A, a, a nation within, within a nation, so to speak. But um, in the context of, of a country like America, right, it, it's built on an individualistic heritage that, that does come out of the Bible, right? It has a long history. It's not, not, not to be anachronistic here. But what the individualistic approach allows us to do is not only to cooperate, but to actually live in the same nation, right? It, this is what allows America to exist in a way that, that most other nations have, have great, great difficulty doing. Um, the, the, the issue is that, uh, of course, the, you know, the, it's easy to say all this. The, the rub is that these things are obviously incredibly difficult. And in, in Menachem Begin's speech, which I mentioned, he says something that, that's you know, really um, easy to say but very hard to do. He says that, uh, referencing the issue of the play, wh where, where does, what's the role of the state, the group, and the individual in America, let's say. So Begin addresses the question in the Israeli context, and he cites 
uh, Conrad Adenauer, who was um, Chancellor of Germany, had a line where he said, so, it was something to the effect of, uh, it was either him or one of his interlocutors in, this, in these discussions about reparations, said, the German nation will not be able to recover its dignity and to return to the world of nations unless it pays reparations for its crimes. And what Begin said was very interesting. Begin said, no, it's the exact opposite. The payment of reparations, the assumption of the state, that the state can somehow achieve forgiveness for these crimes, is inherently undignified, both for Germany and for the Jews. Because what it, what it does is it sidesteps the real problems that we're talking about, and it pretends like we can paper them over with, with easy solutions. And, it, it, and, and Begin also said that it, 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 it disrupts the ability of the individual victim, the real victim, to, to, to rise up and to recover and to build a nation. And so the only way that real dignity would be achieved, Begin said, is when the Jewish nation would rise up to the point where the Jew could talk to the German on, on, on a plane of, of equality, right? And now it's easy to say that, but of course it's hard for someone who's suffered Right, or, or the descendant of someone who suffered, to simply be dignified, be strong. Right? It's easy to say that. Right? But ultimately, that's the only solution. The state can't answer this, this problem. So I think we're all running around for different solutions. Is it an individualistic solution? Is it a group solution? Where do we find our strength? Uh, we, could, we can argue about that. I, I don't, I don't you know, have a definitive answer, but, but ultimately, um, the first step has to come from the, the, the people who've, who've suffered. I see it in the context of Christian-Jewish relations. The more dignified and confident the Jew in the situation, the more comfortable they are engaging with Christians and trusting them. This goes back to your question of how do you trust somebody? Because if, you, if you're not secure about yourself, then you find it very difficult to trust somebody else. And, and ironically, ironically, I know many Orthodox Jews who are theologically very informed and, and oppose many Christian theological points much more strongly than, than more liberal Jews, but they're much more comfortable talking to Christians and engaging with Christians than many, liber than many liberal Jews who say, oh, I don't have such an issue with the theological differences, but who, who, who keep a mistrust in their hearts because they're continuing to live this historical process without a confidence, without an inner dignity that arises from a nationalistic sentiment. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, I think yeah. the, 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 the answer to the problem begins with, with, I can only say this from my perspective, I can't speak for other people. I feel like it begins with the descendants of the victims who can rise to the occasion and say, we're, we, we are going to be strong, we're going to be dignified, we're not going to accept easy solutions, but we're going to, we're going to pursue real solutions. Thank you. Good. I, one in the back. Um. Yeah. The, um, is, I think my question would be primarily four great messages, first of all, and uh, one of them said we're in the third great awakening without God. That would be this rabbi. <laughs> 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 that was those rabbis. But if you think about we're having a great awakening without God, we're trying to have a national covenant in a great awakening without God, and so the question for the rabbis is, A, is that even possible, and B, um, what are the cogs and mechanisms that Israel put in place as a nation so that it could have a renewal and a regular reappropriation of its national covenant? Uh, when I heard you talk about blessings and curses, it kind of just reminded me there was a lot built into Israel to help them, I think. Uh, did everybody hear the question sufficiently? about? Okay. I'll take that one. Let me, let me answer this as a dual citizen. Um, I, I, I've been living in Israel for 31 years, and I, I constantly have two eyes, one on what's happening in Israel, one what's happening here, on precisely these issues of social cohesion and what holds everything together. Um, and, and I think you're, the, the question you ask really highlights exactly how difficult the American situation is. In Israel, there's a cohesiveness that's, that's born out of uh, a language, out of a shared history, out of a shared threat, that's a big one, uh, out of, out of a, a very small country 
Everyone knows all the favorite vacationing spots. It's, it's unbelievable. You can never mention where you're going without saying, oh, I've been there, been there, been there, been there, been there. <laughs> um, which makes Israelis love to flee to, uh, 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 to, to get away. But it creates an incredible sense of cohesiveness. You have, you have the language, you have the, 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 the religion, you have the history, you have just a whole set of concepts that are part of, of the culture. And then I think, and in America, what do we do? How do we, we have to find something that replaces that. Now obviously, Americans come from the four corners of the world, different languages, different religions. Uh, so we have to find some type of common aspiration that we're all gonna sign on to, more than just live and let live. That doesn't do it. That doesn't do it. The idea that maybe we, there's some type of exceptionalism. We are great and we are going to show the world that we are great, not in a triumphant sense, but that there really is, and I think that we do have the powers as Americans and the culture that is here to produce something great. And we've, when we are all committed to that, rather than just the minimum baseline, live and let live, maybe that'll be able to provide the glue that overcomes the, 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 the tremendous disparity that, that we all have in, come in, in, the, yeah, in this country. Ahead. Let me make a quick footnote on this. So I mentioned I've been in the Middle East for 12 years. <clears throat> and you're here in America and you think, well, there's nothing that holds us together. Black and white, all the others. Nothing holds everybody together. And I go to the Middle East and I'm in a marketplace in Doha, Qatar, okay? And there are black Americans there, white Americans there, Hispanic Americans there. And they're hovering around each other yeah. mm -hmm. thinking, Oh my goodness, what's this foreign country? We've uh -huh. got a lot in common. Uh, so I'm saying there's something uh -huh. here that uh -huh. make, we just can't really name it very well. Uh -huh. But you go overseas and you put a bunch of different Americans who at home say, well, we have nothing in common. You put them together and they form a little circle. It's really remarkable. So there is some American thing here, even if we're all arguing about it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm trying to see how to form this in a question, but I know my identity merging what I was learning in society and what I was learning in Christianity, I think what happened to me is I didn't know the true identity of who God of the Bible is. Mm. And that's where, you know, because I didn't know that, uh, you know, his true characteristics, that it caused me to be confused. And so how, I think that that's the commonality, is that we need to understand the true nature of God and to look to him rather than to mankind to identify who we are. Amen. Everybody hear that okay? All right. Do you want to? Gerald, do you want to jump on that one? Um, I think it's a beautiful statement, and that's uh, testimony to why this conference and this book is needed. Uh, we, we need to bring uh, God, the God of Israel, the Father of Jesus Christ, in, into the conversation about race in America. Yes, sir. I just, I wonder um, what the panelists would say about the role of power, because I think of the, the comment of um, Americans in a different country huddled together. Maybe the experience that they're having is we're not in control of this space, um, and that's something we have in common. But here, the, the role and the placement of power is very different. And so in this conversation of national covenant, where does uh, those who yield power uh, fall in our understanding? You know, they, it reminds me of the verse, uh, I have to translate from the Hebrew, but uh, not, not with valor um, and not with strength, but with my spirit, uh, saith the Lord of hosts. Um, it, it's, it's very easy, what, what Begin was addressing in that speech is that it's very easy to look at the power dynamic and to draw tactical or strategic conclusions from the power dynamic, but the, the progress in this area is only possible when you reverse the power dynamic, when, when spirit is what comes first, meaning it's always easy to look at yourself in a position of vulnerability and then look for the causes of the vulnerability and seek to strike at those causes of a vulnerability, but the it can also tie you down into a self-destructive um, situation where you're you're so busy trying to point to the causes of your lack of power that you don't raise yourself up in the situation and and I I don't like the word because of how overused it is in our society and abused it is but you have to empower yourself 
Um, nobody is going to, to do that for you, and pointing at the source of your problems isn't going, isn't going to help. And then what Begg's point was, even if you succeed in getting the extension of the source of your problems to empower you, all that's going to do is lower your own, your own level of, of dignity. Let me add, may I add to this? Uh, my students at Georgetown will tell me over and over again about how much power has made it impossible for them to be in control of their lives. And I say, well, are you going to vote? And they say, well, no, I'm not going to vote because I have no power whatsoever. <laughs> and so I tell them, and this is you know, from Tocqueville but from so many others, look, we can look up to power and recognize our weakness, or we can dare to look out to our neighbor. And sometimes you know, power is made perfect in weakness, as it turns out. Some of you know the reference. Uh, and and the, the wager about how we save liberty in this country is we're not going to get it by looking up. We're going to get it by looking out to our neighbor and looking into their eyes and realizing that the vision I have of who they are is not who they are. And in having a real-time conversation, which is always difficult because it's not choreographed and you don't know what's coming next, you discover who you are and you discover who they are. This is why text messaging is frankly the thing that scares me most about America today because we don't even dare call one another. We text one another to see if we can call one another. We are so frightened. Think about this. this look, the problem is not, the problem is always, it's here's the deepest problem, always. And if, if we're scared to death to even call our friends and our, and our parents, our children, we have to text them first to see, to get them prepared and for us to prepare. <laughs> we have a really serious problem. And when we can't reach out as neighbors, then we are going to have demonized understandings, which political parties will take full advantage of. Mm -hmm. So we can either look up and recognize our weakness, or we can dare to look out. And I don't know what we're going to find, except I'm pretty sure we're going we're to discover that it's way more than we thought if we dare to do it. But we have to dare to do it first. Can I, can I add to that Please, just yes. very quickly? The, the power dynamic, you can see it in action just to, as a concrete example with Israel. Until 1967, Israel had widespread sympathy among you know, some of the same characters who started demonizing it immediately after 1967 when it achieved military victory and achieved power. Because from, from this, from unfortunately what's become a, a, a victim mentality in the third world, which has prevented development, too often, is that, well, if you're powerful, you're, you're bad, and if you're weak, you're good, right? It's not about the content of your character or what you do or your actions or this type of society you have. It's just, are you controlling power or, or not? And, and the reason why the Linda Sarsours of the world and the Tamika Mallory's of the world can't just make a simple repudiation of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel uh, sentiments is for a very simple reason. It's part of the victim mentality that they're promoting. It's inseparable from it. So, so I, 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 think, I think that's part of the, you see the power dynamic on, on display there. Okay, we, we have, for the sake of time, three more questions. And um, that means if you're in my field of vision, you're on. So, yes. Um, Professor Mitchell, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, my name is Rabbi Steven Slater from Temple Bethel, the conservative synagogue in Denver. Um, uh, I found your commitment to pragmatism very hopeful, but your suggestion that we look in the local direction very despairing, um, because it's when I look at local communities in particular um, that I see the highest degrees of racial segregation or, um, or socioeconomic segregation. Mm -hmm. And I actually think we need to keep class within view um, mm -hmm. here as well. Um, which might actually be a predominant form of discrimination. And so I'm looking for the institution to focus on um, to actually get into the pragmatics, where we can, where we can rely on each other in face-to-face -face encounters, yeah. and therefore create a new relationship. And I'm at a loss, because if I look at churches, they're some of the most segregated institutions in the country, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or, or form the okay. whole religious uh, uh, covenant community, really. Who would like to take that? And if I look, to, that. And if yeah. I look to schools, Okay. That's and good. Yeah. The schools, the situation is actually even more difficult um, because first, it isn't individuals who are primarily running schools or communities that are running them. The state is involved, and perhaps that can help. But actually, theological language is exiled from schools. Good. Um, We're going to have to let's let him let's let him answer. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Look, uh, I, I lose. It's thank you. You know, I lose a huge amount of sleep over this because I, I think I see the problem, which is identity politics. I think I lose a huge amount of sleep over this. Uh, you know, I, I can see fairly clearly the pathology of identity politics. I can see clearly that uh, that th that the theological language has to be in place. I can see that the kind of radical pragmatism is absolutely necessary. And you know, look, I live in Cambridge, Maryland. I don't live in Washington. Cambridge, Maryland, if some of you may know, was the site of uh, you know, the, the basis of H. Rapp Brown's Burn Baby Burn was, was Cambridge, Maryland. I mean, there are still huge tensions there. Mm. But I, I could, I, my hope is, my hope, my assessment is that, that the churches are gonna have to play a part because they're about the only uh, counterpoints to this identity politics. The schools are teaching identity politics. I fight this at Georgetown all the time, but it's K through 12. And increasingly, I, I think it's also just plain charity. And I don't know that many people are willing to do this, but how about you know when we're in the Walmart, we look at each other and recognize each other's personhood. I think this is gonna go some way toward doing this. I think we just have to have a whole new attitude about who other people are in our society, and we're, we become so hermetically enclosed in our own little worlds. Mm -hmm. So I can point to what the solution is, but I don't think it's an easy one. So just very quickly, anecdotally, the United States is in the Middle East, and we keep saying we have to be in there because without us, people couldn't solve their problems. No. Sometimes you have to just get out, and you have to let people deal with their problems and face their problems together as a local community. That's the formal solution, but I know the long history of this in America, and I know it's agonizing, so there's no easy answer to it. I mean, I can give you the formal answer, but I can't give you the practical one aside from charity and the churches. After that, I don't know. Another, one more, uh, two more questions. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I was interested in you talking about the circle of Americans that were from different ethnic backgrounds, but there was cohesion in that group. And I'm interested if there's not some perceived threat in that area. And I'm not interested in implying that into a larger scale in that we, we are all fighting a common enemy, one that we don't necessarily see or acknowledge, Amen. but it's out there. And, and that, how, how to pull people together to, and cast a vision that that's the enemy that we're fighting mm -hmm. and that God's grace applies there can pull us together if we perceive the threat and, uh, and start understanding the threat. If that wouldn't be a unifying force for us to use and then appreciate each other's gifts and contributions. So, so if I could, if I may, and if, if, you, if you could not hear, um, the... Um, um, the, the question, I, I think you're, you're framing it in terms of a type of spiritual yeah. warfare or struggle that could possibly be a centrifugal force that brings people of faith uh, into dialogue uh, with one another. So anybody would like to take that or comment on that? I, or I'll make you. <laughs> I'll do it. Gerald, you I take mean, it. You've been quiet. Uh, a centrifugal force that... Is spiritual warfare a, a common ground uh, among, uh, despite particular differences uh, amongst faith communities? I think we probably should qualify. I, that. Yeah, I think it certainly is. And I, and I think I would mention one remedy here that um, has not been mentioned too much, and that is prayer. Um, I, probably most everyone in this room is a person of faith, um, Jewish or Christian. And uh, I, I think maybe our churches, I'll speak as a Christian, should make it a regular matter of prayer on Sunday mornings. Prayer for racial reconciliation. Father, what can we do? Help us. Help us and show us what we can do in our congregation for racial reconciliation right here in Birmingham. We have time for one more. And um, please, yeah. Um. I'm not sure if I want to address this to the rabbis on the um, podium or anyone else, but this is a question that's just been burning within me within the last 10, mi 10 minutes. Um, 
How, do, how does patriarchy and white supremacy within Judaism and Christianity contribute to the distrust African Americans and African American Jews feel of both faith spaces? I myself am an Orthodox Jewish person of color, born and raised in an Orthodox Jewish community from New York. God bless my heart. <laughs> I lived in Israel for a number of years myself, and the racism I experienced there is not something we're discussing here at all. I'm, I've lived for three years in Nigeria, working with Ugandan Jews, who today are not welcome in the state of Israel, even though they practice Judaism just like anyone else. Wow. It hurts me that we're sitting here pretending wow. that the place I love, the place I call Zion, does not welcome me the same way it welcomes the white males on this dais. And that's something we need to talk about in a real way. Truth and reconciliation begins with vidui, confession. It begins with us telling the truth the way it is for all of us, not just for some of us. And that's something that I think we sugarcoat on a regular basis and that we refuse to address because in our being presented with the choice of choosing Zionism over Judaism, we're not afforded the opportunity to just stand before God and say, in the beginning, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning, God, not you. Let's let the, uh, by far the most interesting question of the day, I have to say, so I'm glad to end on this one. Uh, rabbis, why don't you yeah, take that one for us? Yeah. You want to start? Yeah. Oh, I have yeah. mine. You go. Okay. Um, thank you for raise, raising that, that painful issue. And um, um, I, 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 we all hear very clearly where, where the pain is coming from. Uh, it, race is an issue in Israel as it is in every predominantly white country in the world. Um, um, I can only speak about, I, I am not familiar with the particulars of, of, uh, of, of what you've endured, though it's clear that it's, it's very, very deep and, 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 and painful. I can't speak about what I see about Ethiopian Jews. Uh, Israel has a, has a community of um, uh, immigrants from Ethiopia, obviously black, uh, now second generation. They number, I don't know, several tens of thousands. Um, from time to time, there are difficulties that are similar to here. There's dim discrimination in all the forms that one would expect to find here as well, uh, in the workplace, in just stereotypes. At the same time, I, I see also, uh, when I talk to my youngest daughter about this, she's 12, and I remember when she was in elementary school, and she has some, some Ethiopian uh, immigrants in her class, and talking to her about well, that they're black. She didn't understand what I was talking about. She obviously recognizes that their pigment is darker. But for her, the, the, the binary notions that we have, white and black, don't exist. And I think that this is true for, for a lot of Israelis. There's a lot of interracial marriage between Ethiopian Jews and other Jews. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's, that it's, that it's perfect, but I think that, that the, the, all the things that I mentioned before, that bind Jews together ameliorates the situation here. I, I, wonder, I wonder whether part of the difficulty of the situation that you have clearly encountered isn't simply uh, a, 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 an issue of race, but also just the difficulties I have as an American. I get all sorts of discrimination as an American. I have Israelis reading all sorts of things into me and the way I talk, my accent is still no good after 31 years. I mean, I don't mean to make light, and it's not nearly as, as, as difficult in any way as, as, as I'm sure the experiences that you've had. But I think that, that I wonder to what degree those experiences are solely race, and to what degree they're also just being an American who comes, probably an American who didn't, didn't I, 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 I don't know, but biographically grow up with all of the background. When you take someone who is very, very different Good. and put them in any other culture, it's going to be it's going to be a tough, a tough, a tough time. Thank you. I don't say this in any way to paper yep. over the injustices yep. that were done to you, but I wonder whether there's many levels to it. Thank you, thank you, Robert, and yeah. thanks to our panel.